Well, shalom. Shalom. Eh, it's not bad. <laughs> Want to try it again? Yeah, wait for me. Wait, 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 wait. Shalom. shalom. There you go. Now you know how to make a nice Jewish boy feel like he's right at home. <laughs> I do feel very much at home. It's a, it's a delight to get uh, to meet you and uh, to be with you tonight. I'm very grateful for all the diligent work that uh, Miss Charlotte uh, poured into making sure that we got here and got squared away. I'm very grateful to you, uh, Pastor Brandon, for inviting me to come back. I hope you won't be sorry. <laughs> um, I had my back to you, so I didn't see. How many of you already know a little bit something about the, the ministry of Jews for Jesus? Any of you? A number of you. Well, then I'll go home. <laughs> no, not yet. Um, Every once in a while, I run into someone who says, he'll, he'll say something like this. He'll say, Jews for Jesus? How long has that been going on? <laughs> yeah. And I usually say, oh, 2,000 years. <laughs> yeah. People forget that all of the first followers of Jesus were us Jews. People forget that Jesus is the Jewish Messiah as well as the Savior of the world. People forget that all of the first missionaries were us Jews, and that's who and what we Jews for Jesus are. We're missionaries. This actual ministry, this modern-day ministry, began just 50 years ago, and we started in North America. We uh, pretty much planned to stay just a North American phenomena. Um, Ruth and I uh, have been on staff since uh, 1978, and we were serving in the Los Angeles branch of Jews for Jesus, and then the Soviet Union, most of you are not young enough to remember this, old enough to remember this, but uh, when the Soviet Union started to fall apart, we got this crazy idea that we should try to take a team into the Soviet Union, and everybody said, we couldn't do it. And I took the idea to Moish Rosen, who started the work of Jews for Jesus, and he also said it was impossible. And then I said, so should I forget the idea? And he said, no, I'm just telling you why you can't do it. Go ahead and do it anyway. <laughs> By God's grace, <laughs> we did. And uh, it was a thrill. We were able to start the work in the collapsing Soviet Union, first in Ukraine, then in Russia. Um, I remember when Maxim Amosov, who some of you will remember, he was, I think, the first acquaintance that you had with Jews for Jesus some years ago. Uh, I remember when Maxim and his wife came on staff in uh, the late uh, 90s. I remember when he took over the, the Moscow work. I, I think you know Maxim is with the Lord now. This was a big surprise. Uh, he went home August, last August. And, um, but for those of you who do remember him, uh, I've been in touch with his widow, widow, Olga, and with his, um, older daughter, uh, Katya, who serves on staff with us. And they're doing okay, but it's a transition. So if you think of it, just remember them in prayer and pray that the Lord will continue to bless and encourage them and, and continue to, to, um, to bless and to build the work that Maxime so diligently and effectively led for so many years throughout all of Russia. These are, um, these are very, very exciting times. These are very, very tumultuous times in Ukraine, in Russia, uh, in Israel, in Gaza. And I want to give you an update about what's going on so that you can pray. I want to open up the word to you uh, and share with you from God's word, that's most important. But I want to, uh, I want to show you a two minute video that my colleagues in Israel put together. They knew that I would be speaking, uh, to you and to other congregations. They put this video together. I'd like to show it to you so that you'll get an idea of the, the very, very, uh, exciting ministry that's being conducted in the midst of a ferocious war in Israel. Uh, can we play the video and then I'll come right back up. The war affected our team. Uh, some of our staff live in cities that are bombed severely, so some of them even lost friends. We all know, either firsthand or secondhand, people who have lost loved ones in those terror attacks. There has been a rise in anti-Semitism 
and we're a part of the Jewish community, so we have felt the hatred. I think the people of Israel feel uh, hopeless and fearful about the future, and uh, they don't know what's ahead. So many in Israel are not only living in fear, but living without the hope of redemption in Messiah. Very few people believe in Jesus, maybe less than 1%. Most of the Israelis do not have access to New Testament uh, in their native language. Uh, more than 100,000 residents of Israel were evacuated from their homes. They needed care. The Lord calls me to visit and to comfort and bring food. There were weeks that we've sent 5,000 packages of food to families throughout Israel. We have been producing animated um, verses from the book of Psalms just to uplift um, Israelis. God is opening up people's hearts to the gospel right now in ways we have never seen before. We've received over 600 requests for the New Testament in only three months. We have an opportunity to come alongside them and stand with them and love and support them in ways that are only possible when people hit rock bottom. Jesus' message is one of love, hope, and healing. It is relevant for Israel is now more than ever. Just encourage your Jewish neighbors, encourage your Jewish friends with prayer, with visits. Would you pray for the peace of Jerusalem? Would you pray for the salvation of the Jewish people? Together we can love and serve the people of Israel. I want you to stand with uh, the Jews for Jesus around the world, Israel, uh, Ukraine, Russia, really all over the world here in the States. Uh, later on, um, I'll give you more of an update, but uh, just before I open the Word of God, I really want to encourage you uh, to make a commitment to, to stand with us in prayer. We can't do what we do unless brothers and sisters in Christ are praying for us. That's it. That's the bottom line equation. You pray, we proclaim, people come to faith. Without your prayers, we are handicapped. It's as simple as that. Uh, I'd like to invite you during the course of, uh, of my message, take a moment, uh, take out your phone, scan this QR code so that you can get our free prayer letter. I want you to know how to pray for us. And if you scan this code, you can do that. Or if, uh, if you prefer at the end of the service, Come to uh, Ruth and me at the table with our literature on it. You can pick up one of these cards and uh, fill out a piece of paper <laughs> that uh, will allow us to send you our free prayer letter. Now, some of you are thinking, it's okay, don't send me anything. I'll pray for you. No, you won't. You'll forget. It's normal. But if you let me send you our free prayer letter, you will be provoked to pray for us. I want you to understand the heart of Jews for Jesus. I think the best way I can show you our heart is by taking you to a passage of scripture I really love. It's in Romans chapter one. If you've got a Bible with you, open up with me. Would you, Romans chapter one. We'll just look at a couple of verses. Romans chapter one, verses 15 and 16, where the apostle Paul writes these words. He says, so for my part, I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. In these two brief verses, the Apostle Paul tells all of us who are sincere followers of Yeshua at least five crucial Truths. If you understand these truths, you will understand what drives the ministry of Jews for Jesus. What does Paul tell us? He tells us what we must proclaim. He tells us how we must proclaim. He tells us why we must proclaim. He tells us to whom we must proclaim. And he tells us when we must proclaim. Let me unpack each of these. What must we proclaim? If we are sincere followers of the Messiah Yeshua, the Messiah Jesus, what are we commanded to proclaim? In verse 15, Paul says, I'm eager to preach the gospel. In verse 16, he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. What did Paul proclaim? The gospel. What are we commanded to proclaim? The gospel. 
Now, some of you are sitting there and you're thinking, Avi, that's obvious. We know and love the Lord. Yeah, we proclaim the gospel. Yeah, it's obvious. But you know, it's very easy for sincere believers to proclaim everything except the gospel. In fact, if there are if you're already a believer in Jesus, if you've already repented and given him your heart, there are messages, good, solid, biblical messages that you need to hear that are not the gospel message. But they're solid biblical messages, messages designed to provoke us to love the Lord with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, with all of our strength. Messages designed to provoke us to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. Good, solid Biblical messages, but those are not the gospel message. What's the gospel? What's the message that the people outside the walls of this building need to hear? The gospel. What's the message that my people need to hear? The gospel. What's the gospel? Well, the gospel is called good news. That it is good news. It's also bad news. What do you want to hear first? The good news or the bad news? Hmm? The bad news? <laughs> you must be Jewish like me. <laughs> I'm going to give you the good news first. The good news is this. God loves each one of us so passionately that he provided a way for each one of us to be forgiven of our sins and to be brought into a deep, intimate, everlasting, personal relationship with him. The bad news is, the only thing that we deserve from God is his everlasting wrath and judgment. Why? Because we're sinful. And you know, we don't become sinful. We're born that way. You want proof? How many of you are uh, parents? Yeah, me too. Now, I know that your children are the most wonderful children <laughs> who were ever born, just like mine. But let me ask you a question. Did you have to teach your children how to lie? Did you have to teach your children how to disobey? Did you have to teach your children how to be jealous? Did you have to teach your children to Put their own interests first? No. That's natural. That's our nature. We're sinful by nature, and we, we practice this rebellion against God all of our lives. That's why, that's why our lives as non-believers are never really satisfied. You know, uh, we pursue this goal and this goal and this goal. And even if we achieve the goal, we're still hungry. Why? Because we're cut off by our rebellion from the only one who has a genuine purpose for our lives. We're cut off from the only one who can genuinely say, well done. Well done. This is why, because of our rebellion, this is why our relationships don't work. No matter how good they are, they're still corrupted by sin. We still lie to each other, we still deceive each other, we still envy each other, we even betray each other, even as, as believers. We even hate each other. This relationship is broken by our sin, so every other relationship that we have is tainted by that sin. And even if we want to change the status quo, we can't. A leopard can't change his spots. I cannot change my nature. And if we die without this problem being addressed and fixed, then we enter an eternity cut off from God, a conscious eternity that is so horrific the Bible can only describe it with images. Isaiah called it a place where the worm does not die, where the fire does not end. Jesus described it as a place of absolute darkness. It is a point of total abandonment by God, where there's no, no vestige of his presence whatsoever. We can't even imagine the horror. 
We need to be rescued. We need to be rescued from the power that sin exercises over our daily lives. We need to be rescued from the penalty that our sin deserves. And that's why Jesus came. When Jesus died on the cross, he took upon himself the judgment of God that I deserve and that you deserve. You know, he screamed from the cross in agony. Did you ever think of that? You know, we see pictures and statues of, of a docile, weak Jesus quietly on the cross. He screamed. He writhed in agony. He twisted. And at one point he cried out in agony, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why those words? I have a theory. I think, number one, he chose those words because he was pointing us to Scripture. He was telling us it's going according to plan. Those words are the beginning of Psalm 22, which is a prophecy of his crucifixion written 1,000 years before the event. So on one hand, he's telling us, even in his agony, it's going right according to plan. But I think there's another reason why he, he screamed those words. In that moment, Jesus the man was suffering the absolute horror and agony of being eternally and totally forsaken and abandoned by the Father. And he screamed. That was supposed to be my scream. And that was supposed to be your scream. But he loves us so much that he willingly endured that agony so that when we repent and ask his forgiveness, we never have to know that horror and never have to utter that scream. And then he rose from the dead. Why? Many reasons. I'll tell you my favorite reason for the resurrection. <laughs> so that he could forgive us. Listen to me. Corpses can't forgive. Jesus isn't a corpse. He's alive. And when we come to him with repentant hearts, acknowledging our guilt, our responsibility, and when we ask him to forgive us for the agony that our sin caused him to endure, then our hearts hear the most wonderful words that could ever be spoken. He says, my son, my daughter, you're forgiven. Now follow me. He rescues us from the power that sin has over our lives by giving us his spirit who enables us to break free of that. He rescues us from the judgment that we deserve. He gives us an everlasting relationship with him. It's all ours when we repent. That's the gospel. But there's a problem. See, um, if you proclaim a message that tells people we're sinful and that requires them to repent, people don't like you very much. Have you ever noticed that? You know, I was six foot four before I joined the ministry of Jews for Jesus. No, not really. <laughs> so, Paul tells us how to proclaim the gospel. He says in verse 16, I am not ashamed of the gospel. In other words, we must proclaim the gospel without fear and without shame. But I'll tell you a secret. I am ashamed of the gospel. And so are you. We are ashamed of the gospel because according to the old man, according to the old nature, we fear the rejection of people more than we fear displeasing God. We're ashamed of the gospel, and so we choose silence. Even though God has told us over and over and over again, do not be silent, do not be afraid, speak. He said those words to the Apostle Paul, 
who struggled with fear and having to be ashamed. Even Paul. But we don't admit that we're uh, ashamed of the gospel or afraid, do we? We, we flatter ourselves with uh, phrases like this. We say to ourselves, well, I don't want to offend anybody. That's not true. <laughs> See, what we mean is, I don't want that person to dislike me. I don't want that person to get angry with me. You see, the most important thing in my life is that everybody likes me. In fact, the most important thing in the universe is that everybody likes me. In fact, that's why Jesus died and rose from the dead, right? So that everybody will like me, right? No. <laughs> Long ago, we Jews for Jesus made a very important theological and strategic discovery. What people think of us is not the issue. What people think of Jesus is the issue. Whether or not people have had the opportunity to hear the only message that can rescue them, that's the issue. I'm going to make you a promise. It's safe for me to make a promise because I'm leaving tonight. You're not going to see me again. <laughs> Very safe. So let me make you a promise. Here's the promise. I promise you that if you spend hours every week in deep Bible study, and if you spend hours every week in deep intensive prayer, and then if you go out and share the gospel, I promise you people will still not like you. I promise you that. <laughs> we must proclaim the gospel without fear, without shame. Why? Paul tells us my third point. <laughs> he says in verse 16, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to anyone who believes. What that means is that only the gospel message has the power to save. Nothing else saves anyone. Okay, not our good deeds, not our love, although yes, we must be loving and kind and compassionate. But faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. The gospel message is a content-driven message. It, in, it includes, it contains information that must be heard understood, believed, received, and responded to in faith. That's a content-driven message. And it's the only message that can save. No other message saves. We're strangers. But I'll tell you something that breaks my heart. You know, Ruth and I have had the, the privilege I mentioned we, we've served on staff in Jews for Jesus for 46 years. We've had the privilege of, of living in six countries, pioneering the works in, in Central and Eastern Europe. And I meet many Christians. And some of them tell me something that just absolutely breaks my heart. On the one hand, they tell me how much they love my people. That's always nice. And then they go on to say to me, do not talk to your people about Jesus. Jews don't need Jesus. You're, you're automatically saved because you're chosen. It's a very popular heresy that's being taught and believed by Christians who love us Jews, being taught and believed in the States and in Germany especially and in the UK especially. We're, automat we're automatically saved just because we're Jews. Really? Well, that's interesting. <laughs> um, did any of you ever read uh, when the words, when, when Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life, no one comes to the Father but by me? Anybody read that? I read it once, twice. Any okay, what do you think? Are those words true for the people in the United States? Yes or no? I agree. Are those words true for people in Germany? Yes or no? I agree. Are those words true for people in Brazil? Yes or no? Yeah. I agree. But when Jesus spoke those words in history, who was he talking to? Who are the only people in the room? Wait, 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 wait. Let me give you a clue. 
Us Jews. Jesus, the Jewish Messiah, said to an entirely Jewish audience, at Passover, a Jewish holiday, I'm the way, the truth, the life, no one comes to the Father but by me. If those words are true and necessary for you, and they are, they have to be true and necessary for the people to whom he spoke. Paul tells us to whom we must proclaim. Verse 16, he says, to the Jew first, and then to the, and then to the Gentile. <laughs> That's problematic, isn't it? Yeah, why did he just say to everybody? <laughs> why did he have to say to the Jew first? Was he a Jewish nationalist? No. He was a Jewish missionary. You know, Paul was not called to be the apostle to us Jews. Paul was called to be the apostle to you, to the Gentiles. But we know from the book of Acts that he always began his ministry in every single city by first bringing the gospel to us, to his fellow Jews, and then to the Gentiles, starting in Damascus, recorded in Acts 9, going all the way up to Rome, as we have it recorded in Acts 28. We always see Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles, bringing the gospel to the Jews first, why? Because Paul was the apostle to the nations, and Paul understood the key in God's plan for bringing the gospel to the nations. Paul understood why we Jews were chosen. According to Scripture, we Jews have been given many different gifts, such as the land and the covenants and the promises, but we have only been given one call, and Paul says that that call is irrevocable. What's the only call that Israel as a people ever received? To be a kingdom of priests, which means a nation of intercessors and proclaimers. We were called to always be in the forefront of global evangelization. You could say that God chose us Jews because he loves the Gentiles so much and wants to see them saved. You see, there's a problem. We can't proclaim the gospel until we believe the gospel. And we can't believe the gospel until we hear the gospel. And we can't hear the gospel until someone brings it to us first. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that only we Jews are supposed to proclaim the gospel. I'm not even saying that we're very good proclaimers. We're just very loud proclaimers. <laughs> And every one of us has a call to be a witness in some way, in some fashion, unto the Lord. What I am saying is that there's only one entire nation that was called to be an entire nation of witnesses. And that's us Jews. We Jews have a moral obligation to fulfill that call. We have a moral obligation, I believe, to return to all the, the countries where we died proclaiming God's message of life. And we have a strategic advantage. There are people that we Jews can reach that nationals cannot reach because of the history. I'll tell you a quick story. Uh, last summer, I was in Warsaw, Poland with a team. I was out on the streets. You probably don't know what happened to us in Warsaw, but Warsaw was the worst of the Nazi ghettos. 450,000 Jews just from that city alone went to their deaths in a very short period of time. So here I am out on the streets of Warsaw, Poland, wearing a shirt that identifies me as a Jewish believer in Jesus, handing out my tracts. This Polish man walks by, and he just stares. And then he walks away, and then he stops, and he comes back, and he, he parks himself uncomfortably close to me. He's noticeably upset. He's not angry. He's upset. And he stares at me, and he says, you're a Jew. I said, yeah. He shakes his head. He said, you're a Jew. I said, yeah. And he says, and you come back to this country, to this city, to tell me about Jesus? I said, yeah. And he said with anguish in his heart, he said, if there's anybody who should understand that God does not exist, it's you. You. 
So I said, well, if God doesn't exist, then what happened to us in this city shouldn't bother any of us, should it? Shouldn't bother my people or me. Shouldn't bother you as a pole. Shouldn't bother any of us, right? It just happened. There's no right, no wrong, no morality. It's all just chemicals, material. And I said, but it does bother us, doesn't it? It infuriates us. Our anger proves that we know there's a God because we want him to explain himself to us. And we had a good talk. It was a difficult talk. We talked about half an hour. No easy answers. But my point is this. He would not stop. He would not have stopped and talked to anybody else about Jesus. But he had to talk to me. We have a strategic advantage in some places. We must fulfill the call. And the day is coming when we will fulfill the call. Because God has said, this people I have formed for myself, they will declare my praise. But that's why you praying for my people's salvation and for the global work of Jews for Jesus is so crucial. I said it before, you pray, we proclaim, people come to faith. And then they start proclaiming the gospel. Finally, Paul tells us how, or rather when we must proclaim. He says in verse 15, I'm eager to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome. There's an urgency in his words. It's as though he's saying, I'm ready right now. Anybody want to guess how old I am? What do you think? Anybody want to get? Hmm? Pretty close. 73. I've been a missionary for 46 years. Ruth and I have had the privilege of living in six countries. It's been a good 46 years. It's been a fast 46 years. Do I have another 46 years to preach the gospel? No. Do I have another 10 years to preach the gospel? I don't know. Do I have a month left to preach the gospel? Do I have five minutes left to preach the gospel? Some of you are hoping I don't have another five minutes left to preach the gospel. <laughs> Do you remember what Jesus said? to his disciples in John chapter 9, he said, we must do the work of him who sent me while it is day. Soon it will be night when no one can work. Brothers and sisters, night is coming. Soon. For me, that means either he comes back or I go home to be with him where I get to say hello to my brother Maxime again. And a bunch of other people. Oh, what a tragedy. <laughs> One way or the other, night is coming. Soon. This is the only time that I have. This is the only time that we have. We must preach the gospel now while it's day. Because night is coming when no one can preach. So pray for us. I invited you earlier, scan that code, or um, after the service, come up to us at the literature table, pick up one of these cards, and uh, give us your contact details on the card. Give it to me. Give it to Ruth. One way or the other, please, let us stay in touch with you through our free prayer letter so that you can know specifically how to pray for us. Um, I'll tell you another way that you can stand with us. Let us help you. We brought a lot of uh, materials with us. It's on a, a table. You might have noticed the table as you came in. 
There are some pamphlets that are free. I'd like to recommend a couple of books that are not free. I'm embarrassed to recommend them because I wrote them, but I'll recommend them anyway. Um, this one is called Jews Don't Need Jesus and Other Misconceptions. I wrote this book in a loving way to um, counter that false teaching that's becoming extremely popular in the United States. Another book uh, that I wrote, Never Ashamed, Stories of Sharing Faith with Scoffers and Skeptics, the story of uh, mostly lessons I've learned, lessons that Ruth and I have learned from uh, 46 years of sharing uh, the gospel uh, in a number of, of different countries. See if there's something on the table that will build you up in your faith. There's a final way that you can stand with us. That's financially. Um, you have been very generous as a church supporting Jews for Jesus. I'm very, very grateful. Um, if you want to support us uh, in specific projects, you can, but I want to tell you why you should not give to Jews for Jesus. Number one, never give to Jews for Jesus from your tithe. Tithe goes to your home church. Number two, um, don't give in the future to Jews for Jesus if uh, you're giving because you heard me speak and you enjoyed or appreciated or liked what I had to say. That's not a reason to give. Your gift does not enable me to travel around and speak in churches. That's not what Ruth and I do. Your gift enables us to bring the gospel to people who need to hear the gospel. That's what we do. There's a final reason why you should never give to Jews for Jesus, and that's if you're not a believer in Jesus. God doesn't want your money for his work. God wants your life for his work. He has a greater gift for you first, you know. It's, it's the gift of eternal life. It's the gift of the forgiveness of your sins. Why would you not want to receive that gift? Anyway, whether you ever give a gift or not, please let us stay in touch with you by sending you our, our, our free prayer letter. Pray for us. You pray, we proclaim Jewish people hear the gospel and come to faith. The call wakes up in their hearts, and we don't know how to be quiet. And the gospel goes out to the world. Let's pray. God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob, we thank you so much for the gospel. We thank you, Jesus, for what you did for us when you died on the cross for our sins and rose from the dead. We thank you that you're coming again soon. Keep your eyes closed just a moment longer, would you please? I realize that there might be some here tonight or maybe watching online who have never repented of your sins and asked Jesus for, your, for his forgiveness. You've never made a sincere commitment to follow him. Maybe you've heard the message all your life, but you've never responded with repentance and faith. If that describes you, I'd like to invite you to do that tonight. I'm going to say another prayer with my lips. And if you know in your heart that you have never before repented of your sins, then I invite you to say the prayer in your heart silently that I'm going to say right now with my lips. Jesus, I know that my life does not please you. I know that I deserve your judgment. But I believe that you died as the payment for my sins and rose from the dead. Jesus, please forgive me. From now on, I will follow you. In your name I pray. Amen. You can open your eyes now. But just one last word. If you just said that prayer silently, don't leave tonight without talking to someone. All right, talk to Pastor Brandon, talk to me, talk to Ruth, talk to someone here whom you know, whom you trust. Let us congratulate you. Let us pray with you. Let us encourage you. You just took the most important step you'll ever take in your life. God bless you. Shalom.